Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to New Books in Medicine, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Rachel Pagonis, and I'm your host for this episode. Today, I'm speaking with Elizabeth Kelly Gray about her book, Habit Forming, Drug Addiction in America, 1776 to 1914, which is indeed a new book. It's published by Oxford University Press this month, January 2023. Elizabeth Kelly Gray is Associate Professor of History at Towson University in Maryland, U.S. Her main research interest is American history in an international context in the early national and antebellum eras, focusing on cultural history and diplomatic history, with particular interest in the history of addiction and American foreign relations. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. This is always a topical topic and so interesting to learn more about its history. So to begin, would you tell us a bit about your own background and how you became interested in the history of drug addiction in the U.S.? Sure. Uh, it's a slightly um, indirect way. My my training was in the history of American foreign relations. And one of the things that I, uh, um, one of the incidents that I studied a conflict from the early 1840s was a uh, a war that is known as the First Opium War. This was fought between China and Great Britain in the early 1840s. And the idea is that there had been British merchants who were importing large amounts of um, of opium into China. It was having a demoralizing effect on the population. It was affecting the economy. In 1839, the Chinese tried to end the importation of opium and Great Great Britain went to war with them and and ended up winning that war. So I was studying what did Americans think of this conflict, and I realized I can't really know what Americans thought of an opium war unless I knew what they thought of opium. Hmm. And it was this this widely used medicine, but it had become a, a problematic addictive drug in China. And I realized really not many people had looked at drug addiction as an American problem in this early time. So I, uh, I, I decided to take it on. I thought that sounded like an interesting, uh, an interesting topic. And, um, and, uh, and I ended up, I, at first I was going to go up to about the 1870s and then I decided to, to take it up to the 1910s, but, but that was the origin of it. Hmm. Fascinating. Do you mind if I ask, what did Americans think of the opium war? It was actually really interesting. For the most part, from the from the perspective of Americans in America, they thought it was this very cut and dried thing um, that the Chinese were in the right, the British were in the wrong. They see it to a large extent as this challenge to their religious beliefs because they had assumed that since Great Britain was a Christian nation, that they would behave in a you know quote Christian manner. And here they saw the Chinese doing what they believed to be right. At the same time, there were American merchants in China who were selling opium. Um, not that people back home knew that they were. There were American missionaries who were trying to proselytize there. The American community in China was really on the side of the British, but Americans back home were just shocked and disappointed, um, really, with with the British pursuing this because they they saw it as as clearly uh, that the Chinese were in the right. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> Um, so the book has a timeline, as you mentioned. It yes. begins with the nation's, the U.S. nation's inception in mm-hmm. 1776, and it ends in 1914 when the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act was passed. Why did you decide, decide to make 1914 your end point? I, it, it's such a good question. That what I when I was trying to figure out exactly what this should be, drug addiction. Um, in America is not really publicly discussed until the 1870s. But what uh, was going on is up until 1914, which I think could surprise people, there really were no national laws, um, overwhelmingly no national laws that limited access to addictive drugs. Um, There were some state laws, but those could be easily gotten around if, you know, I mean, for example, drug laws were rather um, in the late 19th century were sort of strict in New York, but more lax in New Jersey and people could order things through the mail. So uh, literally, I mean, up until the early 20th century, parents could send their 12 year old to the drugstore to buy um, to buy morphine and, and, and the child mm-hmm. could come home with it. So I decided that what would really be most interesting would be to study this period of about 140 years where the drugs to which people could become addicted were 
freely, for the most part, freely available. Um, and uh, and even though, I mean, addiction does increase a great deal because they're so easy to buy and inexpensive. At the same time, there was no real association of drug addiction with crime because if mm-hmm. someone were addicted, you know, they might try to stop and then they'd be disappointed that they couldn't stop, but then they could just go to a drugstore and, and, and buy more and, and, uh, and do so at, at, you know, pretty low prices. So I, I, there are some historians who have looked more at why did we end up moving toward regulation? And I just wanted to sort of study this, this era when there really were, were no regular, and again, there were state regulations, municipal regulations, but they had um, comparatively limited effect in terms of actually diminishing use. Wow. So there really wasn't um, much of an association with crime at all before the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act was passed. Exactly. And one of the things I found was that there were people who, either doctors who had worked with people who were addicted um, and uh, and some other observers who specifically, when the, when the, and the Harrison Narcotic Act said that, um, which it, it's passed in 1914, it goes into effect the next year. And it said that um, nobody may get a prescription, nobody may buy opiates or cocaine unless they have a doctor's prescription and that the doctor had to be, you know, writing a good faith prescription for it. And there were people at the time who were literally saying, we're going to start seeing an association of drug addiction with crime, which again would have been news to the readers of those publications at that point, because it was just not something that had been, um, that had, that had been an issue at that point. Yeah. Well, and I want to circle back to the, you know, effects of that act at the end yes. of our talk. But oh, sure. first I want to ask you, this is the question that everyone asks me when I tell them I'm reading your book. They want to know, what drugs were Americans using at this time? Okay, sure, sure. Over, I mean, the, the, the book is primarily about opiates because those were the ones that Americans were primarily using. An opiate is a drug that that comes from the opium poppy. And just, just because of the, the current opioid epidemic, opioid really more refers to uh, synthetic drugs. But the opiates yeah. came from the opium poppy. Um, and their two main sources of value as medicine is that is for pain relief and helping someone to fall asleep. And so the the most common forms um, were uh, laudanum, which was a combination of opium and alcohol and spices. And this was something people would have kept on hand the way that we have medicine cabinets today, you know, something that would have been um, widely, widely used. Um, morphine is one of the act, it's, it's technically an alkaloid. It's this active property in opium and it gets isolated and morphine injections become a popular method of administration, especially in the from the late 1860s on. Um, and also much later in the century, in the 1890s, um, heroin is a semi-synthetic opiate mm-hmm. and was also, again, um, advanced as, as a uh, as having medical value initially. All of these were. Okay, so it's mainly about opiates, but for example, there is a chapter about um, cannabis or hashish. They were never calling it marijuana back then. And, um, and, uh, it was, it was, it had some medical use. It was said to be useful, for example, with the treatment of convulsions, um, with, uh, uh, sometimes advanced as, um, as treating what we would call, um, alcoholism. Um, and there were, one of the issues with cannabis was that they could never isolate sort of the active, quality of it. And so they couldn't give what they regarded as effective doses. But there were products like um, a product called hashish candy, which is, I think, was described as being akin to gumdrops that um, is sold. In, and it's advertised as something that could treat asthma or what they call nervous diseases. But it's also something that people are using just to sort of enjoy its its effects. And then that sounds like that sort of rings a bell with the present time. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Kind of, you know, <laughs> cannabis gumdrops that uh, people use. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And there, and there is, and, and with all of these, it, it was sort of, there was this blurring because some of it, I mean, for example, many women who became addicted to opiates, you couldn't tell whether someone was using it medicinally or not because they all were advanced as having this medical, and then and then the hashish candy, yes, was was. Uh, I mean, I mean, newspapers in the late in the eighteen sixties, the ads for hashish candy were just all over the place. Um, and and then toward the end of the century, 
we see um, the emergence of cocaine um, and uh, all, and um, that was uh, um, sold as a cure-all, um, valued as an anesthetic. And it was also something where, again, someone could go to a drugstore and buy what was called a Qatar cure. And it would be if someone's really stuffed up, they could buy the stuff that has cocaine as a significant ingredient and just... And, and I mean, they would be, you know, squirting it up their noses and it just would clear out the sinuses. So, so the, those are the main <laughs> ones. So, so I figured, yeah, I figured I would, yeah. I would cover everything that was used then that now is strictly regulated or, or banned um, it, with the exception of alcohol, which other historians have, have done a great job of, of covering. Yeah. So one of the things that's really interesting is um, how it, it took people time to understand or recognize that these substances were addicted or, or what even is addiction. Mm -hmm. And so, and you sort of get to that. You talk about this nomenclature and the book subtitle says drug addiction in America. That's the term we use now. Right. Um, but in the book, you use the term habituation and you refer to users as habitues yes. because that was the language you tell us that was employed at the time. And yeah. I'm wondering, does that difference in language reflect differences in attitude towards the behavior and towards the users themselves? It absolutely does. And I, I decided to use the word addiction in the title of the book because I figured I would focus on communicating what the book was about. And habituation would have been a more accurate term, but I, I thought, you know, it, it, they really are talking about what we would call addiction, but they they really did not use that term. Um, and their, their option, I... I there is a lot of attention to the language that is used. Like now, you know, there is this emphasis on referring to someone who has an addiction, you know, as having a substance abuse disorder. Um, and, um, and there have been terms that are very pejorative that have been used in the past. And, and, um, and back then the term habitué um, was connected to the idea of, of it being a habit and the use of the uh, referring to it as a habit connoted that it was something that a person could end their use just by summoning willpower. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember reading, and, and again, this is when the Harrison Act goes into effect and, and people who are addicted are not going to be able to get their drugs. There was someone who was saying um, that this is uh, this is not that in essence that being addicted to uh, to a drug is not like as he put it it's not like biting your nails, you know that it really mm -hmm. was um, and and it's interesting because there are people who are working with, who are close to people who are addicted, maybe they're, they are their doctors or, or their relatives who can see that it is on this other scale. And, and, um, physicians and researchers now recognize that drug addiction is a brain disease, that when someone uses a drug in an ongoing manner, their brain changes. And that's why, um, the cravings endure and quitting is so difficult. Back then there was none of that real recognition. There were some people who realized that it was much harder than that. And um, and there were people who themselves were addicted who couldn't understand why they couldn't stop using it. So so I, I, I like using the term habitué because it was something that even though it was connected to the idea of a habit, it didn't seem to have a pejorative connotation the way some other language does. And in fact, there I found sometimes where they would say, well, only only people in this particular group should be referred to a, another phrase that got used as dope fiends. And, and there oh. were some terms that had a much more sort of uh, positive, positive connotation. And so I, I figured I would use habitué. Yeah. I mean, habitué sounds kind of like aficionado, like someone who's, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, um, you know, dabbling in it, enjoys it. But yes. Yeah. But from some of the stories that you, you know, histories that you've written to people, um, correspondences, it sounded like maybe people who didn't use drugs thought habitué, that's not a pejorative term. But for the people who were actually using them, a lot of them and their family members did realize how difficult it was to stop using them. They, they did, they did. Um, and, uh, and, um, Yes, and 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 again, we're we're quite mystified at this because it was something that was, you know, I mean, certainly addiction is a concept we all understand to some extent today. But back then, um, addiction was not uh, addiction in America was really not discussed as a problem until the eighteen seventies, and so before then, there really is this 
mystery and 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 people thinking oh that they should be able to just reduce the dose over time um and and there would be cases where i remember one incident i read about where uh there was i don't know if he was a husband or a brother but um he, anyway there was a woman who was addicted and her family in essence locked her in her room without the drug um to try to get her to end her use and it was she had her nightgown on and it was freezing outside and there's snow and yet she you know, jumped out the window to try to find, to try to find uh-huh. a supply of it. So, so there is this assumption that if there's just this kind of, you know, strong method used that the person can end their use and then, and then seeing these, uh, you know, this behavior that indicates just how intense the addiction could be. Yeah. So what happened in the 1870s that? It's really interesting. I've, I've tried to pinpoint part of me thinks, and no one actually says this at the time, part of me thinks that it just, once the Civil War is over, there's more space in publications to write about this. And I, I don't know if, because it, it seems like that's part of the timing. Um, drug use, especially opiate use, had been escalating for the middle third of the 19th century. And we know this because opium was never produced in large amounts in America. It was imported and they begin tariffs on it in in the 18 early 1840s and so what we see is that while the population of America is growing the amount of opium being imported into the country is growing at a much um, faster rate and and there are people who are who are directly say stating um in the late 1860s that this was not pri- I mean there was a lot of opium use um certainly um, as a consequence of the Civil War with injuries and illnesses, but but there are authorities who are specifically saying that, no, no, the vast majority of this was unrelated um, to the war. And so in 1860, and, and what I see before 1867, let's say, is occasionally someone will say, uh, oh, that there's, you know, there, there are many people who are um, addicted to opium. Uh, I found one article that many people are addicted to opium in New York City. This is from 1857. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, the person who's waiting on you, the person who, you know, um, might be uh, uh, taking care of you or the, or the minister, you don't know, you know, th- that it's widespread, but then there's nothing more. And it's just, you just see these glimpses. In 1868, um, in particular, there's a man named Horace Day, who himself had been addicted, and he was a physician. He writes a book called The Opium Habit with Solutions to the Remedy. And he is, of course, describing his own experiences and 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 what could potentially work. And it's after that we see a steady stream of other works by other people who had been addicted, by um, by uh by other physicians, and and they're noting that this is a huge problem. And so that's when it kind of breaks into this uh, this major sustained story. And the sources become, of course, much more abundant. And again, I think it's a combination of the fact that this had been growing and and there were just there was whether it was focused on the Civil War, whether, you know, whether they just needed one person to kind of come forward and and tell it, you know, from a firsthand perspective. Um, but uh, but af- but it, but that's when it really it really becomes a public issue. Yeah. And at that time, were they still saying habituation? Did anybody use the term addiction? I- I occasionally, a very, very seldom, I will see the term addiction, but overwhelmingly, they are still referring to it um, as a habit. And addiction, I would say, I mean, it's really, I would say more like late 1890s and certainly early 20th century that addiction becomes the preferred term. Um, and, uh, um, and, 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 so I would say, but but at that point, it would still be referred to as a habit, and there is still this effort to kind of understand what it is, um, but uh, but still but still more more likely to use the term habit in in those initial years. Yeah. Um, so in chapter two, which is called mm-hmm. "American Drug Use Quietly Escalates," mm-hmm. um, this is the period you're talking about in the mid 1800s, um, and you write that opiate use increased particularly among affluent white women who had been prescribed the drugs by their doctors. Yes. So this raises a couple of questions for me. And first is, why this demographic? And second is, do you see any parallels here to today's opioid epidemic? I know it's always dangerous comparing historical periods, but today's opioid epidemic involving middle-class people becoming addicted following prescriptions by their doctors. 
Oh, I think I think definitely, and and so there there are two there are two. Um, so with regard to why it ends up being middle class white women in particular who are the most likely to become addicted, um, the uh, the vast vast majority of cases of addiction at this time, and I'm talking like eighteen eighteen sixties, eighteen seventies, eighteen eighties, is from someone seeing a doctor. There is a physician in the toward the end of the century who literally. Uh, he he estimates that approximately ninety percent of the cases of addiction originated with a doctor's visit, and part of this was because um, uh, morphine had been isolated, the syringe had been invented, and doctors loved, or I don't want to say loved, but doctors frequently frequently resorted to morphine injections when they would have a patient who was dealing with pain or sleeplessness because. It seemed to be almost magic that giving an injection of morphine, the person would feel almost instant relief. So the patient is happy, the patient's family is happy. And so doctors frequently resorted to it. And there was this belief that a person could not become addicted to something unless they had tasted it. So if they hmm. ate it or drank it, but the idea was, well, if it's a if it's an injection, then obviously they never taste it. We now know that. A morphine injection was one of the most, uh, one of the ways that a person was most likely to end up addicted, and so um, doctors would uh, were using this excessively. Um, with so there's part of it is that, and part of it is that white middle class women were the most likely to go to a doctor, in part because there was an idea that it was sort of um, unmanly uh, for, you know, like a man should not go to a doctor if he's, if he's ill, he should just sort of tough it out, just endure it until the, the, uh, the illness goes away. And also at this time, um, you know, America in the 19th century was a much more rural country than it is today. Um, Forms of communication were not great. And so most Americans would not have had access to a doctor either because they couldn't afford to see one, or even if they could afford it, they might not necessarily have easy access. And members of the middle class were more likely to live in proximity to a doctor and see one. So it ends up being women. Um, and uh, and again, partly because men were, there's sort of the idea that they shouldn't, they shouldn't go to a doctor. And also because many of the problems women had were what we would um what were referred to frequently as um female complaints mm. for which there was no treatment and so the doctor would you know at least could at least could do some pain relief so so we end up with um overwhelmingly it being an issue for um for for um for middle class women and um and uh and 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 them being white women and i mean and race class and gender play this sort of ongoing role in terms of perceptions. There was, um, uh, there was, um, the, the parallel with the opioid epidemic, um, is certainly to a, uh, to a large extent, what we've seen with the opioid epidemic is that it has, not only does it originate with, with medical treatment, um, but also that it has been identified as a problem that has in particular, uh, hit the white middle class. And there has been this focus on how um, many of the parents, for example, have pressed for a focus on treatment rather than a focus on on um, on you know the criminal justice system as a as a response. And I think that that is the the right response. But what we also see is that when addiction, you know, if we if we go back, you know, thirty years, let's say thirty thirty or thirty five years, when there was this perception of addiction as being an issue primarily um, among uh, among uh, people of color, that the focus was on mass incarceration, and so what we see is, and again, I I believe that the, you know, the I I have great sympathy for anyone who is addicted and for their families. And I believe that treatment is the approach. But what we see is that the response is often shaped. There, there was a historian named David Courtright who said that people's attitude towards addiction depends on their perception of who is addicted. And I think that that is, that there is definitely a, that that is something that seems to be um, a recurring, a recurring theme for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really um, telling quote. Yes. And so the women got morphine injections from their doctors, but what did they have in their medicine cabinets at home that they were taking? 
they would have had, um, I mean, to a large extent, other opiates would have been available. One thing is that morphine was something that they could keep buying. And so the doctor might give the person morphine injections over time or or might just let them know that this is what it is. And there were also, and, and again, this is something why the 1870s things become sort of different. There were a lot of um, companies that began marketing medicines to a national audience. And they, um, and, and many of these were really quack remedies that, uh, uh, many of these were quack remedies and, and, and until passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906, no manufacturers had to tell what was in them. And so literally there were things, you know, someone might sell what they claimed was a cure for morphine addiction and the product contained morphine. And so the person thinks it's working and and doesn't realize why. Now, those, for the most part, go away in 1906, but there are people who are observing in the later 19th century that there are many people who were just sort of trying anything um, because the drugstores would be full of these cures, the the newspapers would be full of ads for these cures, and and people could mail away for them, which which gave them a degree of anonymity if they were uh, not wanting people to know that they were dealing with addiction, for example. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, and of course the fact that these were being sold did imply that they were, that they were safe. Another, another piece of this is, um, there is a figure from the 19th century, the image of the invalid, you know, the, the woman who is in mm. bed all the time and she has this bed table with all these bottles on it. And I do wonder to what extent those were, they, they, that seems to fit exactly with, with what I've read about, about cases of morphine um, uh, of, or of opiate addiction where, you know, you know, maybe after she had her last child, she had some sort of um, uh, problem in childbirth and, and, um, and has been in pain since and, it, and she can't be treated. And so she become, you know, and so all they know is that she just doesn't do much work and she's in bed so much. So that would be another dimension of this. Yeah, yeah. And do you know what people were doing if the woman or her family wanted to stop using so many drugs? What were they doing aside from locking her in the right. room in her nightgown? Right, right. Yeah. Um, there were there were um, sanitaria where they would like wealthier women could could go to the to these uh, places where um, the focus was on reducing um reducing their use and and uh helping them to end their use and and some for some that would have been uh success there there was uh um and this goes back to this is a actually a British case in the 1830s where there's a doctor who is asserting that there are um he knows of women who might be in their 70s or 80s who remain again what we would call addicted but they're still able to kind of you know walk long distances and visit friends and sort of do things. And so the usage doesn't end, but, um, uh, the usage doesn't end, but the, uh, um, but it, it they still have some, you know, degree of a, a good quality of life. Um, but so there were programs that were for, again, the wealthier, uh, women, these sort of impatient, uh, places. There were also some who were pointing out that if, the woman has, and, and again, or this would be for anyone who was addicted, if they do have an underlying ailment that the person is really self-medicating, if you know that if we cure the underlying ailment, that then the person could potentially end their use. So there is some, uh, there is, there are some cases addressed that way. Another thing is they, that the uh, number of cases diminishes by the like mid eighteen nineties, and frankly, part of that would be because doctors were just becoming much more conservative in their use of morphine and therefore the number of new cases of addiction was was dropping so so there would have been some um there would have been some who were who were helped but again the the programs that existed were really more for those who had the money for a lengthy stay mm -hmm. at uh at um at a at a sort of a residential uh, kind of a program and and Again, unfortunately, the, for for those who were not as well off, they might have been sending away for these uh, these quack remedies that that really did nothing. And then they would have been, in many cases, they were not reporting that these were not helping because they didn't want their uh, their addiction to be known. Yeah, yeah. So 
moving on to cannabis and, and hashish, mm-hmm. in chapter three, um, you write that much of Americans' understanding of, of cannabis came from accounts of its use in the global East. And would you tell us about some of these perceptions and how they impacted on the use of hashish by Americans? Okay, sure. One of the things about there is this the international context is really crucial in terms of understanding what Americans thought of addiction. And part of this is that they don't really see it for a lot of this time as a domestic issue, but they're hearing, you know, travelers accounts of, of uh, use in other parts of the world. They find this, you know, at least they find it interesting. Um, now I will say that scientists today still disagree as to whether cannabis sativa and cannabis indica are the same species or not. In the 19th century, they had this perception that they were definitely two distinct um, species and that uh, cannabis sativa, I mean, it was cultivated widely in colonial America, um, referred to typically as uh, as hemp, and it doesn't have that much of what they were growing, really wouldn't have had much of the sort of narcotic principle, the THC in it, Whereas cannabis indica associated with other parts of um, of the world, um, and and in particularly in hotter locales, and the idea that it it did have more of that psychoactive effect and that it inhibited productivity, and what we what we see is that there is this awareness of sort of what is the drug of choice of people in different parts of the world, and they would see Americans' drug of choice as tobacco. But when they're looking at this, what they what some were kind of contrasting was that the U.S. was a very productive country and others were not that productive, ambitious. And sometimes it gets associated with the drug of choice, the idea that hemp was used to make rope and, you know, rope is used on ships so that the nation can trade or explore and that um, and that the the form that was that was instead used for its uh, narcotic value, um, you know, that there, there wasn't that much accomplishment. Um, and that, uh, um, and, and that, that, you know, that, that these other societies were, were just not as active was the, uh, was the perception. Um, and, uh, and there are, there, there was a book published in 1857 by a, um, a man named Fitzhugh Ludlow. And he had been, nowadays they refer to people experimenting with drugs. He really, I mean, back then they really were, would really be like, what is going to be the effect of this? And he, um, and he was using, um, was using hashish, which he got from a, a friend was a druggist and had a, you know, he got it from that pharmacy. And um, in his work, which is this sort of full length work of his, of what he experienced, and then his efforts to stop, he includes in it a critique of sort of what he sees as an excessive focus in the United States on profit, that there wasn't a much an, enough celebration of nature, but instead there was this tendency, you know, to build factories and mills that might mess up the the local water supply, et cetera. And um and so it does seem like because the drugs would inhibit the person's productivity for some time and often were used in an effort to sort of explore the person's own mind, the idea of seeing it as opposed to more of a focus on productive society, capitalist focus. And I'm not saying that the drug inspired that perspective, but there is this sort of ongoing theme of drug use being associated, non-medical drug use being associated with critiques of mainstream society, I guess. Hmm. And what was the name of the man who was... um who was using it to expand his mind and, and, uh, you, ha- we have, um, Fitzhugh Ludlow wrote the hashish Fitzhugh, eater. Fitzhugh there was, Lud- and there was yeah. another writer named Bayard Taylor who would more sort of, he goes to, um, uh, the city of Damascus. He travels internationally and, and uses it there and then describes, and he takes too much of it. And then he's sort of describing his experiences and, um, and, uh, and 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 you know these writings were very popular, but again, it, Americans were not seeing this as a problem in America. But they just thought this was an interesting thing to read about. That's you know something that they associated with with uh, with other cultures. Yeah, but there was some sort of use looking at, at um, consciousness altering use of the drug. Yes. Yeah, as opposed to, and maybe I'm wrong in saying this, but it seemed like the opiates were more for. Um, getting rid of pain, making you fall asleep, or just kind of making you feel drowsy, good, but not 
um, well, the not expanding are, the mind. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, it, he, the, the opiates are interesting. One of the earliest um, known account we have, where it's a first person account of someone who who was who became addicted to a drug and described what he went through was a book called Confessions of an English Opium Eater, which um, a man named Thomas De Quincey published in 1821, and it's very soon thereafter available in America. And so the the definite purpose of the opiates officially was their value as as um, in um, as a painkiller and a sleep aid. But mm. he he was in pain one day and um, bumped into a friend of his who who suggested he take opium. And in his account of it, and he also describes some terrible consequences and these horrible nightmares he has but uh, but initially he experiences the euphoria before he even really is you know out of the out of the drugstore and so he's describing that and he also he he was a very bright guy um and and partly we know this cuz he certainly didn't wasn't shy about pointing that out and he he indicates that it had that he had these remarkable dreams as a consequence of his opium use, but it was a combination of his opium use and the fact that he already had an amazing mind. Mm -hmm. And so he, and he has this rather condescending attitude where he says, so I, I, the line is something like, if a man spends his day with oxen, he will dream about oxen. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and that therefore there would be this correlation of what the effects of the drug would be with how, bright, imaginative, et cetera, the person is. And we do see later in the 19th century cases of um, Americans who read this and then they want to try it themselves just because they're kind of curious what it will do for them. And again, it wasn't hard for them to to buy it. Mm. Yeah. So that that's a good place to move on to part two, which is called Learning from a World of Users. Yes. Um, and if I understand right, that refers largely to what Westerners learned from the Eastern world of drug use. So what were yes. some of the things that Westerners did learn? And because you make this connection, I'll make this connection. How mm -hmm. did this knowledge relate to colonialism? Okay. it's There are a couple of interesting things, Gwen, because there it, it is truly the case that almost no references to drug addiction in America until about the late 1860s. But before then, there had been many, in particular, European men who would travel to parts of um, what is now the, the Middle East, travel parts of Africa, Asia, and they would describe, they would write travel journals of what they saw and that they would include what they observed. And um, and these this was very interesting to Americans. Again, not seeing it as a domestic problem, uh, but what they would describe, for example, um, for example, in uh, Turkey becomes very much associated, that uh, Turks become very much associated with opium use and the idea that it was that there were some who would use opium in public and that there would be a crowd of people almost sort of watching these people behave in this really uh, eccentric way as a consequence of their usage and that this was something that was used to kind of and 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 to a degree understood as being used so, to some extent the way that some Americans would drink alcohol as, as something to kind of uh, uh, something kind of enjoy. At the same time, there would be accounts of uh, uh, they would describe how anyone who is addicted to opium could be immediately recognized because they are emaciated and they can't stand up straight and and this sort of suggestion that they would be in such awful condition that they would be instantly recognizable, which also helps explain why people didn't recognize cases in America, because it wouldn't necessarily have to be that that obvious. Um, but they would also describe what we would now recognize either as addiction, you know, that this person will be in a, uh, a very dull mood until he has his next dose, or what we would call drug tolerance, where, you know, someone would start off with a small amount and then they need more and more if they're going to feel the same effects and also withdrawal. Um, and again, they aren't using those terms, but there was a uh, a Frenchman named Jean Chardin who traveled to um, Persia, which is now Iran, in the late 17th century uh, um, and wrote a book called Travels in Persia. And literally, you know, 100, 200 years later, Americans are still using his description, including American doctors, because that's the information they have about addiction. And uh, and and again, parts of it 
are inaccurate um, because they they describe, I mean, some of them literally say that anyone who is addicted to an opiate will not live to the age of 30. And so they have some accounts that are inaccurate, but other parts would would ring true. And it really just fills this void where it's something that clearly physicians wanted to be informed about and the public found interesting and and where they get it is from uh, is from these uh, um, international travelers. Yeah, fascinating. So all this medical knowledge coming from a travelogue that was yes, translated. Exactly. Yeah, it was exactly. Tra- yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how about uh, the relation to colonialism? Oh, right. With, with colonialism, um, there are the, what we see is that the association, and there had been this enduring idea um, with regard to um, with regard to uh, uh, drug use, that that if it is being used medically, if a, if a person feels lousy and taking the drug will make them feel will restore health, that's good because the person is returning to productivity. But if the person already feels fine and they're using it to sort of feel better than fine. It being criticized because then the um, because then the uh, uh, person is sort of privileging their own enjoyment or something else, and so what gets used is the suggestion of associating the pleasure seeking use of a drug um, with a lack of industriousness, um, with a lack of productivity, and again, what seems unfair is that I mean. The drinking, you know, alcohol use in America um, for part of the 19th century was about three times what it is today, and you, something that people either use because they don't need to be working every waking minute, or it's used as something to kind of, you know, something that someone might have at the end of a, a rough day to kind of relax. There's, it's seen being used in other countries um, as a sign of uh, that here's a population that isn't making good use of their society they aren't making good use of the land and um and that therefore it's used as a justification for colonialism that the colonial power will increase productivity um and and yet for example uh in south africa um uh some of the farmers there um uh or some of the uh some of the um uh south african um uh native residents were compelled to work excessively for uh for dutch farmers um when they would be uh plowing fields all day and then be required to guard cattle at night and they would some of them would would use cannabis to cope with those conditions and we see examples where there was that productivity and yet the fact that there is this other use going on gets used as an excuse to 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 move in Rather than, you know, as I say, regarding it as, you know, the U.S. was very, you know, a lot of a lot of productivity in 19th century America, but also a lot of, uh, you know, drinking that that could certainly be criticized um, or would be criticized otherwise. Yeah. And was alcohol considered a drug as well? It alcohol definitely is a drug and yet they don't have that same perception. And, and it's one of those things that I find really interesting because they even had a lot in the in the earlier 19th century of what we would call binge drinking and um and yet there's never that sort of taking a step back and seeing that this and and part of it was that back then they didn't have a whole lot of a non-alcohol drink options like we have today, right. you know, and, <laughs> no so, and so, yeah, yes, and 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 for example, um, they the, for a while I think it might have been in not until maybe the eighteen twenties or eighteen thirties that there was even a recognition that beer was indeed an alcoholic beverage, and and so and so and also they thought of water as something that would be more for animals, and you know, beer and wine comes from grain and fruit, and therefore the idea that it had some nutritive value, so they saw it as, in a different way. And again, very high consumption. And part of it would be sort of drinking something just along the course of the day, but um, but also binge drinking on on various uh at various times. So it is it, but I but I saw I've seen even though I can see people writing about some excessive drinking, they don't seem to place it in that in that 
uh, perspective, well, everybody uses something and, you know, they use what they use and, and we use what we use. Right. And, and there also is this persistent idea that some people, and it, again, it's along lines of class, it's along lines of race, the idea that um, members of the upper or middle class can use a drug in a responsible way and that others cannot, and that therefore want to get more strictly regulated with some people than with others. And, and I, I think that could also extend with um, the colonial the colonial approach of, of in terms of justifying um, that, that this is probably not being used in a way that would be uh, necessarily responsible or productive solely on the basis, again, of, of, uh, of whether it's race or, or class or both. Yeah. So um, I now want to circle back to the effects after the Harrison Narcotics Act, which mm -hmm. went into effect in 1915, as you said. What were its immediate effects and then what were its longer term, what was its longer term impact on drug addiction and drug use in America? It, it's such an important question. I, the, I, I don't think that in general people are familiar with the Harrison narcotic. I think it's one of those things that's among the most important things, pieces of legislation that Americans in general haven't heard of. Because before then, you know, drugs for the most part were available. And and the Harrison Act said that people cannot have access to um, opiates or cocaine um, unless they have a medical prescription and that it has to be a legitimate reason for them having it, a legitimate medical need. Um, and I'll just briefly note, there had been an earlier piece of legislation that only af affected the por the type of opium that is used for smoking um, in opium dens, and that really didn't have medical value. So that's it's really sort of a different thing. Um, but the issue was, well, to what extent can doctors prescribe it? What if a person is addicted? Wouldn't that be a legitimate medical need? And it goes to the Supreme Court, and they rule um, just a few years after passage of the act that no, that that it is that the goal has to be uh, that if a person is being provided with the doses, then the doses have to be in ever diminishing amounts. Mm -hmm. That the goal has to be for those people to be drug free. Yeah. Now, um, and and um, now, unless the person does have a documented medical need as a painkiller and, and that type of thing, and what they find is that. It's not that again. It's along lines of, along lines of race, along lines of class. That, and that's when people begin saying this is going to lead to cases of uh, this is going to lead to drug drug addiction being associated with crime because these people are really given no way to end their use, um, uh, or no way to rather to continue their use. And there's really no way to end their use because at this time there wasn't a lot of confidence that a cure was possible. And so uh, there were people who were poorer. And there's one there's one uh, policeman who's in charge of what they call the dope squad in New York. And he says that and he I mean, I'm, I'm quoting him. He says something like the people who we refer to as the bums are the ones who can't get it because they used to buy it from peddlers. And now the peddlers can't operate. And yet buying it from a uh, there were doctors who were sometimes referred to as dope doctors who would write a prescription for anybody, but it would be they would require quite a quite a hefty sum to do that, and the people can't afford that, and so you end up with a a, a huge illicit market growing um, to provide the drugs to these people, and sometimes they would enter uh, various programs that that um, cities were establishing, but the problem was that the amount of the drug that they were being provided was not nearly what they uh, what was needed to keep the craving away and the doses were supposed to drop. And so um, and so it does not succeed. And so you have this huge increase at that time of uh, of addiction. And I will say that there are different things that go into this because the Harrison Act actually require results from an international scenario where the U.S. was trying to get European countries to restrict the opium trade, and they thought, well, we need some legislation. The drug addiction rate in America had actually been dropping, but the the part of what makes the legislation possible is that the perception of the, quote, typical addicted American at this point was no longer a middle-class um middle-aged white woman who was addicted to morphine, it was more likely to be associated with a young man uh, who was using heroin. Mm. 
far less sympathetic group. And I and and from from the research I've done, it seems clear that some people didn't mind if they were not alone, not just inconvenienced, but were suffering from having the drug uh, access removed. But the fact still remains that you end up, you know, we end up with the creation of an illicit market and, uh, and that, you know, there is a lot more support for what I would call restorative drug use by some people than by others. And, and so, um, and so there's uh, this opposition to that use. And then we have the illicit market and, and drug association being associated with crime, where I think to a large extent, it seems almost, they would seem almost inextricable at this point, but uh, you know, until 1914, they were they were not connected. Yeah. So, are we still feeling those effects today? I think absolutely. I, because I, I think that, and and I will say, I'm one problem in the 19th century was that addiction did grow rapidly, in part because the drugs were so widely available. Um, but the problem in terms of the response, I mean, I, I think that the response where the focus is on treatment and on maintenance, which means providing people who are addicted to drugs with doses of their drugs um, is not only good for the people who are addicted, but also makes a society safer because, again, drug addiction and crime do not need to be inextricably linked. I think that's part of what this shows. Um, but what we also see, again, is that continuum and and in in America, for example, there's far more resistance to uh, uh, methods of so-called harm reduction, where the focus isn't on a person necessarily ending their use altogether. But how can this happen in a way that will be as um, that will do as little damage either to the to the user or to the society? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and so we see this, but but it is it is at that time that we see this and then they switch to the schedule of drugs in 1970 but um but of course they're just responding to what had been growing at that point for several decades yeah yeah and addiction has continued to rise am i correct in saying that um because of the opioid epidemic and again that is something that is that we can trace directly to um to the uh, well, I, I would say to the medical community, but to, to um, pharmaceutical companies who advanced, um, we could call them uh, at least extremely, extremely misleading and they and knowingly misleading physicians in terms of the degree of addiction of the drugs, mm-hmm. emphasizing a focus on people, uh, on, on doctors trying to gauge patients' pain and then treat it. So, um, and this is something that's been going on now for, for uh, more than 20 years. So it, it and it, so it is there is that resemblance for sure but um um but again you know it, it coming in as it was in the late 19th century uh yeah from uh, from medical use that then that then keeps going yeah so it'll be interesting to read 100 years from now you may not write it but somebody <laughs> will <laughs> the yes. history of drug addiction in america part 2 exactly exactly yeah. yes yeah. yes yeah. Well, Kelly, we've taken up a lot of your time today, but I do want to ask um, what you're working on next. I am. Uh, my my next work will n- not be focusing on uh, on um, on drugs. It will be uh, focusing. Actually, it will be a study of uh, the uh, on antebellum Baltimore um, and uh, mm-hmm. a study of what I'm trying to do is a study of the of all the different all the different. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to use the word storylines. There were so many things going on in antebellum Baltimore in terms of uh, you see the rise of the abolitionist movement, which partly begins there. You see um, uh, Baltimore at that time being the nation's third largest city. And I'm trying to see if I can do sort of a study of a city in its entirety with all the different um uh with all the different um uh uh themes of american history that are going on in the city at that time and it's not just a study of the time but also perhaps a way to present history almost in more sort of a novel format is is my my goal so well that is the that is the next project when you say novel format do you mean novel is in new or novel is in a book of Fiction. Oh, good question. Actually, kind of both. I want it to. I want it to read as much like a novel while being one hundred percent grounded in the historical sources. Yeah, 
Yeah. And so that is my and I, I uh, and I've chosen as my focus um, this, uh, you know, um, Baltimore at a very interesting time um, in its uh, in its history when um, when so much was going on in, in, in the city and the nation as a whole. Yeah, fabulous. And do you have a personal connection to Baltimore? Um, yes, it is my uh, um, it is my uh, my hometown, and um, and uh, also uh, I'm I'm uh, living in in uh, in the suburbs of the city. So I, I see it as something that I can be exploring both through the historical sources and also um, sort of almost from a uh, a geographical perspective of just you know what what uh, what remains from that time. So that's the that is the that is the the focus of the next project. All right. Wow, that sounds like a really interesting project, and I'm I'm looking forward to reading your next book. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, everyone, I want to remind you the book is Habit Forming: Drug Addiction in America, 1776 to 1914, uh, written by Elizabeth Kelly Gray and published by Oxford University Press, and it is well worth a read. And Kelly, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. <laughs>